Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I uh, appreciate everybody coming. Uh, we're not going to be doing anything Gallagher style, so if you're in the back and you want to move up, that's okay. Uh, my name is Jonathan Mostowski. Uh, this is Tracy Walker. Uh, we're going to give you a little bit of an introduction about ourselves, and then we'll go ahead and kick into our, uh, our presentation for you. Uh, so as I said, my name is Jonathan Mostowski. I currently work at the United States Digital Service Headquarters as a procurement advisor. Uh, prior to that, for the past 11 years, I worked at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency as a contracting officer. Uh, in that role, I served in a variety of capacities regarding acquisitions, uh, generally focusing, though, on infrastructure services and application services. Uh, while at NGA, I implemented uh, a, an acquisition that allowed the agency to procure applications that were developed uh, by outside parties and hosted in an app, uh, app store, similar to like an Apple-type environment and allowed a uh, pay per download uh, uh, circumstance. So that was a pretty neat acquisition we did over there. And then also began working as agile development methodologies became more prominent over at NGA. Uh, and we had a lot of top down um, direction in, that, in our agency to use agile practices. Uh, I developed uh, or developed and implemented an acquisition strategy for doing those contracts structured in a way that allowed flexibility. Uh, Tracy. And uh, I'm Tracy Walker, and before I joined the U.S. Digital Service, I st was working at the White House as a contracting officer for the CIO's office as well as the Office of Digital Strategy. So I've been doing the IT contracts for the, um, I started under the Bush administration and then into the Obama administration. And before that, I was doing IT contracts at GSA. And so, um, you know, like Jonathan, about three or four years ago, actually at the beginning of the administration, they came in with a whole bunch of really cool uh, tech things that they wanted to do because they had the Obama administration had just won using social media and um, all of the great technical tools. And then they came into uh, contracting world and said, I want to buy all this stuff. And we're like, we have no idea how to do this. So um, over the past several years, we've really kind of taken a look at how do we do what we need to for the end user and also how do we keep it legal and so um, like he said about three or four years ago we started going into agile acquisitions and creating methodologies that work in order to get things delivered quickly and then as well as having a, a, a flexible contracting methodology that also iterates as much as the uh, software development practices do so uh, that's why we're here today and also um, we both helped I don't know if anybody is familiar um, with the tech far but we'll talk about that a little bit but we both contributed onto the original drafting of that and are working to improve that and implement that so uh, so, so it's recognizing it's about four o'clock and uh, you know probably been a long day for a lot of you. We want to keep this casual. That's why we're sitting here. Uh, if, if we're talking about anything and you have a question, uh, you can just feel free to, oh, okay. I thought you had a question already. I was like, we haven't even said anything yeah. yet. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I had to go get my caffeine. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll come around with the mic. We're recording this. We'd like to put it out on Max or CIO.gov later. So to get a better sound quality, it'd be great if Okay, so uh, please don't hesitate to ask and we'll do our best to answer those questions. Uh, so today we're gonna be talking to you about basic agile acquisition and just if I, if I could get sort of a show of hands or nods, um, wanna get a sense of the room. Are, are most of the folks in here, are you IT? Uh, are you related to IT side? And the other side's gonna be acquisition, so I'll give you your choices before. So IT <laughs> side? Okay, and so the rest of you would be the acquisition, consider yourself the acquisition side? Great, any others? Just, you know. Stumbled in here? Okay. Just All curious, right. what did you stumble in here from? Well, I, I'm with the micro agency of five people, and I'm the admin officer, so okay. I do it all. You're Great. Right. I'm <laughs> just trying to learn. I don't know what agile acquisition is, so I'm... Then you're in the right room. That's what we're going to talk about. <laughs> okay. Very good. Uh, so just to kind of introduce, we're both at the uh, United States Digital Service. Uh, our mission is uh, to transform the way our government works for American citizens and businesses by dramatically improving the way the government builds and buys digital services. So that's what we're trying to do. From our perspective, we're doing it for the procurement piece. And a big part of that is helping folks understand what it means to buy Agile. Uh, so Tracy alluded to the tech FAR. Here we talk about two of the main documents that sort of serve as a backdrop to what we do. The Digital Service Playbook was drafted by the United States Digital Service, and these are 13 key plays drawn from successful practices in the private sector and government 
that if followed will help the government build effective strategies. Highly recommend you visit that, and there's the link up there for you. Uh, also from that link, you can get to the associated document, which is the tech FAR. And I always think, you, you know you've come up with a really brilliant, unique idea if somebody else came up with the exact same idea at the same time. And, and that's exactly what happened here. Uh, Tracy and I had never met each other. We were working in completely different worlds. Um, both of us were contacted independently from OFPP and both contributed to the tech FAR and had very similar solutions to the problems they were trying to solve. Um, so uh, I believe there were other contributors as well, but we, we helped put that together. And what the tech FAR is, uh, is basically the acquisition piece of how to implement the 13 key plays. So recommend you read both of those documents. You may also be familiar, familiar with the Agile Manifesto, and, and you can kind of put all of those pieces together. Uh, and as Tracy mentioned, we're now working and starting to work to the next generation of the tech FAR, uh, where you know we're continuing to learn based on our experiences and working with various agencies, and so we just want to keep the documents current and evolving. Uh, so. Um, there were a lot of hands in here with acquisitions, so that's great, but depending on how, uh, what role you play in the acquisition lifecycle, whether you're a contracting officer, or program manager, core, or otherwise, um, uh, one of my favorite uh, conversations about Agile is that you can't do it, the FAR doesn't allow it, uh, and then you usually hear this, you know, the, at least the cutting edge CEO say, well, if it doesn't say you can't, then you can. But some folks are like, yeah, but if it doesn't say you can, then how do you? And so that's why I really like this slide here, because um, these slides actually are really the key pieces to implementing Agile in, in contracting. And, and they apply in various ways. I'm not actually going to go into each one in, in any great detail here, but certainly federal supply schedules are a great tool to leverage. Um, when we refer to co commercial contracting, what we're talking about is, you know, a lot of times when we think traditionally in, in application services in the government, we think of writing custom code because we're focused on that end product. But when you think about agile development, what we're really talking about is a practice that happens all the time in industry. And that's a commercial practice and something you can acquire using, using commercial contracting and streamlined processes. Um, firm fixed price, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later, so I won't get into that too much detail. But certainly, uh, while there are various methods for acquiring agile development, uh, one of the methods that Tracy and I do recommend highly is using fixed price per iteration. Um, and then uh, I do want to point to uh, 37.602, which is performance-based service acquisitions, because quite frankly, what you're buying here in Agile development is a service to deliver functional code. Okay. All right. So I like analogies. Hope you do, too. Um, so what is Agile versus waterfall development? I mean, let's just really get down to the basics. Uh, so on the top one, we have Agile thinking of the Mona Lisa, right? So Mona Lisa's husband actually went to Leonardo da Vinci and, and, and had that painting uh, done as a gift for his wife. Uh, I don't know if that's actually the true story behind the painting. It was later discovered by royalty and became famous that way. But um, so these are two potential models that that painting could have been done. So in the top, what you have here is a concept, right? So he knew he wanted a picture of his wife, literally, but of a woman uh, pos posing in a sitting position. And over time, through iteration, through agile methodologies, he, we, the idea was able to move from a rough or vague idea into something that was polished and eventually a finished product that most properly represented the, en the end user's needs, right? <clears throat> so how does that compare with traditional or waterfall development? Let's say you take that same approach and you, and you wanted to acquire like a system. And you would generally sit down, you'd write down your detailed system requirements. Sometimes we'd spend years uh, in the federal government trying to draft these requirements in great details because you're afraid once you get it on contract, if you didn't say what you need it, you won't get it or you're going to pay through the nose. So we go through painstaking efforts to define it. In this case, uh, uh, Francisco defines in perfect detail exactly what he wants his wife to look like in this picture and Leonardo would begin painting once he had the finalized requirements. So why is one better than the other? And we'll, we'll continue to talk about this throughout the presentation here. But if you notice in the top set here, right, at any given point, if you were to stop, if you ran out of time or money in your, in your process, which that happens sometimes in the federal government, we run out of time or money, uh, you would still have a usable product. I mean, you'd have a sketched painting. You might have a painting with some color, with shading. Eventually, you might get your finished product if you were able to see the acquisition all the way through. 
under the traditional waterfall development, because you're focused on the final delivery, there is no real need to do in any particular order the phased approach because you're not trying to deliver functional products at given states. What you're trying to do is build a finished product. Well, if you run out of time or money in that state, you might end up with just the top third of the painting or half the painting, and half a painting isn't really worth anything, right? So what does that mean? What if the original vision for the painting of Mona Lisa was not just Mona Lisa, but Mona Lisa and their house cat? Well, under the Agile approach, as the painting was being developed, maybe finances were getting tight, time was running out, and Leonardo went to Francisco and said, what is your priority? I can focus on the smile of your wife, or I can finish the painting of your cat. And Francisco said, well, the smile is the most important thing. And here we, we'd have Mona Lisa, if I could cover up the cat for you. But if, under a traditional waterfall development, we might all be sitting here wondering what that cat was really thinking. Because he wouldn't have had the opportunity to make those changes. So um, as, as Jonathan mentioned, we're, we're trying to change the way that we conceptually approach both software development um, with the introduction of Agile into the IT world, but then we also have to do that introduction with the contracting world because um, the whole purpose of, of Agile is to have flexible um, uh, approaches to getting things done. And if you have a flexible approach to getting things done, but you have an inflexible contract, it's pretty much going to fail. So uh, some of the things that we, we talk about in terms of changing terms and changing mindsets is that under the traditional waterfall contracting, we're very used to, to the familiar with the terms like individual labor categories. You're buying um, you know, people to come on that have those labor categories that are very specific. And then under agile contracting, instead of buying people, we're buying teams. We look at the, the fact that an agile team should be recommended from about four to 10 people. And a lot of this is industry practice. So if you really want to know more about Agile, definitely recommend um, you know, going online and, and taking courses. There's plenty of them out there, but also just basic introductions to Agile. There's the Agile Manifesto. It really talks about the idea that the, the process and the outcomes are more important than the requirements that you need up front or what the actual system needs to look like. So uh, where we talk about labor rates or firm fixed price for a completed system, under Agile acquisition, we actually talk about where we, we looked at the firm fixed price per iteration. And why is this important is because at the end of the day, we really want to have functional code, and that is what we're buying. We are buying services to deliver that, but when you actually launch software or a product for your agency, you want it to work, and you want it to be useful for your end users, whether that's internal end, end users or the American public. And so having contracts that kind of set up under um, the traditional you know, cost type contracts really kind of dissuades the, the idea that we're getting an end product, which is something that we can hold a warranty on, we can, um, we can make sure that it's done properly, and, and we have that as an actual deliverable. A lot of times we look at risk in terms of contracting and where does the risk lie in getting something completed. Well, if we go to the firm fixed price methodology, which is by an iteration, which is a very small amount of time, we're not saying contract for just an iteration, but use your unit of measure as a firm fixed price per iteration, which is basically a two to three week, it could be even up to five week time period. And that will allow you to really focus on having a repeated process for the delivery of product code. Um, and which is the, the next line, instead of having one final end solution or application, you have that repeated process for functional product. One of the main tenets that we do in Agile acquisitions is that we separate the functional requirements from contractual requirements. So while the contract sets up and says that we are hiring a company to come in and do software development, and they're going to have a repeated process which is going to end in functional code, we don't have to say what that functional code actually has to look like, what it actually has to do. For example, let's say that you need single sign-on when you originally say that you need a system, and you have, or your, your CIOs come to you and say, we need to, we need to have single sign-on for every application that we have. Well, that's a very large, daunting project, um, and at the end of the day, you know that you need this, but you don't have to define what it looks like for every single solution. You can go in there and start working that out with them, uh, with the team and under the contract, but at the end of the day, you've still got that, um, 
the the controls in place in the contract that says we're iterating, we're getting product, and um, in time when you actually start doing this, maybe there's a new technology for single sign-on that you didn't know existed when the contract started. Because we've separated the functional requirements and the, tech, the contract requirements from the functional requirements, then you can add that new technology in without having to know it at the very beginning of the contract, which is important if you're doing something that's a long-term contract um, or, I mean, technology changes so quickly anymore that it's, uh, you know, you could think of something today and, and by tomorrow it's already outdated, so. Um, some of the other, you know, changing of mindsets is that uh, we look at minimum viable products and release management instead of the full solution or the applications. Really, the concepts behind digital services is getting uh, the products in the hands of the end users quickly, and so they can start really figuring out what it is that they need. Most of the time when you use like Microsoft Word, you're only using about 13% of that entire application and the functionality that you do. So they've gone and done a huge suite of, of services that you could use, but an end user is typically only going to use a little bit. So what if you took that little bit and expanded on that part that they use and really made that piece the most important part? Um, so that's kind of what the minimum viable product is, is getting something out in the hands of your end users and then giving them the chance to come back and say, we need to change this, we need to update that. Under the way that we're doing Agile acquisitions, you do not need to do a modification every time that you want to change the path. It's built into the concept of, of Agile iterations and, and building on software development and design. Um, maintenance is another thing that we kind of typically contract for a little differently under the waterfall methodology. We build something. We have a contract that has an application that needs to be done. We hit the end of it. We've hit the end of the contract. It's delivered. Great. Now we go into a maintenance and an operations and uh, steady state kind of thing. Well, one of the big changes in the mentality around software development and design is that it never is going to end. There's always going to be new enhancements, new features. Every time there's a new iPhone release, you know, that it, it's supposed to be bringing new functionality and making things better. So that concept that you're going to go into a steady state in terms of like software development is not really a true statement. So what you're really doing is you're buying um, continual, en continual enhancements, uh, new development, and it all kind of looks the same as if you're fixing a bug that kind of came out of something that you already released. It's just how you prioritize whether or not that gets done into um, a release. The other thing uh, is new and change features, like I mentioned, those typically result in modifications under the typical waterfall contracts that says that, uh, well, I didn't think of it when I needed it at the very beginning, so therefore it's going to cost more time, more money, uh, we have to do a modification. Under agile contracting, we kind of minimize the ability, the, the need to have that done because we really are um, pushing that concept of you can have, you don't have to have all your requirements known up front, but at the end of the day, you still have your objectives and your outcomes, which you're working to, which relates back to the performance-based uh, statement of work, statement of objective. Uh, that's really what we're using, especially when you get down to user stories, which is a component of the agile process. And, you know, typically, Requirements have been tracked by work breakdown structures, EVM, formal plans. Under Agile methodology, you really have a product roadmap. You have a high-level vision. You have things that you want to get done, and then you have priorities. And so that's kind of the new terminology. And you have your just-in-time functional requirements, which says that you know within the next three weeks we're going to have we're going to do this piece of this, and and that makes sense to do it now. But let's say that there's an emergency that comes in. Let's say that you're FEMA, and all of a sudden there's a new hurricane coming up. And and uh, you need to get new information out on your website quickly. You don't have to go back to halting everything. You just change the prioritization of when those user stories get put into the play. And it has nothing to do with the contract. The, the methodology for that is built into the contract as the contract requirement. And one of the other uh, major changes with digital services as well as uh, um, from the waterfall methodology is that we're not managing projects, we're managing products. And the product is what is actually being delivered. The end product is, is the features, the applications, the user experience that's being given to your end users. And so as a product owner, you care more about that product necessarily than you are in managing the project. Now under the contracts, we still have project managers, but they might be called something a little different, like a scrum master or um, a team leader or something along those lines that's a little bit different than the traditional project management um, mindset, so, yep. I understand really well the distinction you're making between managing a product and managing a, uh, managing a process. Uh, for, 
For example, for the Agile teams, obviously, uh, it, w w in, under the old school, a major clause is the key personnel clause. Mm -hmm. Because you may have somebody who's really good, a high-level manager who you want to see dedicated to the project on a certain percentage of time. That all goes away with the Agile teams concept, does it not? Yeah, so um, we'll actually have a slide a little bit later on that talks about how to build an IGCE, but in re with regards specifically to that, uh, we would generally still encourage the use of key personnel because actually when you start building an agile development team, it's really essential that you have that cohesiveness with the core team. And sometimes you'll have that the key personnel are those core members of that team. Now they may not be a, pro a program manager, but as Tracy alluded, you might have a scrum master, a lead software engineer, a tester, and those could still be key person uh, personnel positions. Okay, be that as it may, and I, I appreciate that, but you know, another question that comes up is scalability, mm -hmm. because because uh, I have to tell you, uh, you know, everybody's everybody understands that the waterfall may not be the best way for the small projects, but it certainly has a value for the larger ones until Agile can demonstrate its use in the real mega projects. Do you agree with that? Or, or, or because what I'm getting at is, you know, I, mean, I understand getting the usability into the hands of the users and all that, and, and, and the two week cycle, and that's great, but but sometimes that may not be even useful in a large, large project, which gets me back to the question of scalability for the, for the Agile methodology. H have you had any really major programs done this way? Um, so yes, and also um, there is a, a term in industry called Agile Portfolio Management, and that is actually the management of many Agile teams. So where we talk about um, increasing in terms of personnel, you're not necessarily going to take a, a Agile team and say that we need something done quicker or we, this is going to be a bigger project, so we're going to make sure that our Agile teams have 20 people on them. At that point, you're losing the, the, the skill and the communication and the team camaraderie, and that is the, the, the good part about Agile is that you are moving quickly, but you can absolutely have multiple teams all running on different aspects of the same project, or they could be doing multiple projects and so it's really trying to figure out in terms of when you define the term project how big is it going to be and what is the ultimate end goal and can it be broken down to smaller pieces that you consider as part of your product roadmap at which point you're breaking that down and saying I need three agile teams to be able to to produce this and and to get through to the end of this exactly yeah. and that aspect of concurrent development on major mm -hmm. programs it, it has always been a real skill and, 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 and to my understanding, it has been very, very well demonstrated using the waterfall concept when it's, when it's done right. But if, if, you can, if you can tell me, you know, in terms of dollars or even effort or something like that, how would you quantify the Agile portfolio team? Uh, how big do they get? Yeah, so uh, a couple of things. One, I wouldn't say that waterfall is dead. I mean, there are s applications where waterfall might make sense if you're building a very distinct, known, and identifiable end product, let's say like a, uh, a uh, library, uh, data library, that the, the, uh, the data and, and the construct are very well known and not likely to change. That's something to consider. But I sort of like the analogy of if you're going to eat a whale, start at the tail. Um, so even if it's a very large product, what you're talking about in Agile is taking all of the things that you know you need and breaking them into must-haves, could-haves, and should-haves, so sort of a prioritization. So when you think of waterfall, think of your integrated master schedule where you say we're going to be here by this date and these are the functionalities that will exist. Here's where we're going to do um, FOC and IOC and you know SAT and FAT testing. And um, what Agile's saying is, yeah, no, testing's good. We, we encourage testing. But instead of waiting eight months before you test to see if something you did makes really good sense, test as you build. So build small pieces, write code, build interfaces, test it. B build small, fail small. That's the concept behind Agile. So even if you're building large, and, and at NGA, there are large-scale projects that are being done with Agile. So uh, when you ask for a dollar threshold, I, I would say there's no. probably not yeah. one. I think it's sort of a mindset. And what we're really talking about here is changing the culture about the way we define our problem. So, you know, is the glass half full, half empty, or is the glass twice as big as you need it to be? It all depends what's in the glass, right? So, uh, you know, I would encourage you to, to focus on that must-haves, could-haves, should-haves, and look at a really big project within your own agency and say, could we have identified our requirements? So even if you have an SRD, or systems requirement document, I, I come from DOD, so... 
I was speaking weird terminology, but if you have a requirements list that was really well documented and uh, used for the building of a system, if you, would you have been able to look at that list and say what's in here is the priority for them to build first? Not necessarily the priority that whether or not we need it, but would it have made sense to build these functionalities first? Because had we, we could have given users this capability six months earlier. Maybe not the full end-to-end -end capability. So for example, if you were building a library, um, you could go either way with this. Let's say um, maybe you said the search functionality was the most usable functionality to give to the end users first. So you might have had a rudimentary data storage, but a, a highly developed search capability that could still manage to work through that. And then over time, you build that back end data storage, or vice versa. Data storage is really important, and search is kind of, you know, they'll still be able to find it even if it's not great. Let's just get a place where they can house their data effectively and efficiently and data tag it. And so if you could break your project up into that, then still Agile would make sense for you. Uh, and so and, and, and if, I, if I understand you, I mean, I, it, 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 at, least, at least the program manager would have the, the system architecture and understood, at least some outline of a system architecture. And what you are doing is you're trying to deliver incremental uh, functionality that, may, that, that fits into the architecture as the whole system gets built. Yeah, system, system architecture is a really interesting part of the conversation. I mean, yeah, you, you absolutely are going to need a roadmap. You're definitely going to need to know what system or what structure the system is going to operate in and what, inter what systems it's going to have to interface with. And those are things you would identify on the roadmap. Where the difference is, is, and to the extent you have that information, by all means, share it and use that for building. But, but the difference is what Agile says is, if you thought you were going to interface with this system over here, you know, build towards that direction. But at the point at which that changes, adjust. And, and whereas you know, you're building and testing, and every, every two weeks you're deciding what the requirements are. And so you're not necessarily building way out here for this capability way up here. You start building for this capability way up here as you approach it. That's what I meant. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, um, basically we are uh, hiring partners to deliver an end product. Um, we talked about the firm fixed price deliverables, um, and this is kind of a definition slide for you to take back um, and, and to have. And really, it's saying that. Um, firm fixed price deliverables under this methodology that we are recommending um, is that they are defined as the completion and acceptance according to the definition of done, which is actually an agile terminology. It's a best practice to have a definition of done for each of your iterations, which is could be a sprint, it could be a cycle, it could be, um, there's many terminologies that, w that are used under the agile uh, name, um, but basically of these iterations are completed and which are based on the contractor's proposed agile software development methodology. So this is still your contractual requirement that you're building in that says that we have a contractual document to hold you to even though we're separating out the system pieces from what is actually delivered in the contract. So at the end of the day, we're not saying that you have to write in that it has to interface with this system over here, because at that point that you get close to that system, what if that doesn't work anymore and you found a better way to do an interface to another system? Traditionally under contract, I would have to, if I had written that in there that said that it had to be interfaced with that system, using your example, then I would have to scratch that out or do a modification to change that, redo it, do another modification that says now that we have to point to this system. And what we're trying to do is take out that effort out of the contractual process and keep it in the technical f and functionality and let the, the, the product owners and the technical people have that flexibility. So, um, and this methodology defines that repeatable process of providing development and deployment services in small iterations lasting two to five weeks. And the results, again, we're really paying for results. We're paying for delivered, usable software data or product which have little to no inherent defects. And this is important, too, when you really look at your metrics, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but quality is very important and can be a high uh, criteria for all of your contracts on this. Um, and I know the slide is kind of hard to read, but it really shows the the concept in a visual way of what I was talking about in terms of a of an iteration. What are we buying in an iteration? So if you're using Scrum, some of the words that are uh, in the Scrum Agile methodology, and if you're not very familiar with with Agile methodologies in general, think of it as kind of an ice cream, as, as being the general 
what you're getting and scrum xp kanban those are all just different flavors so some you may like one flavor better than another it doesn't mean that other flavor is bad it just means that you prefer to use one so scrum and xp are some of the more popular ones kanban and now they're kind of blending them scrumbon and there's several different uh ways to do this but it really comes down to the same kind of concept and that is you're doing some kind of envisioning and, and estimation at the very beginning of your sprint or iteration. Uh, there is a design component where your developers take a look at it and say it's going to take this much to do this functionality. Uh, they develop it. You build your testing in at that point and your quality assurance. So this is where you either have your end users come in and do user acceptance testing. Uh, it's also a really good practice to have auto testing included, which is one of the things that um, you know Google had a big transformation as we're learning from all of our uh, fellow technical friends that they they transformed the way that they did auto testing and brought that in because testing is one of those things that nobody really likes to do. They like to do the the fun development pieces, but the testing part is really a pain. So the more you can auto test and to have that built in to your as part of your system development, that actually saves on on human resources and the time that you have to actually dedicate your end users to actually doing the testing of the actual system itself. Um, documentation is very important in this sense as well. So this is not your big, large, technical uh, book that you have at the end like you would have under a deliverable as, as a regular contract under the waterfall methodology that says here's the entire system documentation. And this is more of the, the technical designs, how we did, what we did, why we did it. And then at the end of that, that gets accepted. You can see the story of that iteration. You store that, you keep that along with it, and then you move on. So at the end of this uh, period of performance, you don't have to have your, uh, your contractors go back and try to remember what they did and why they did something six months ago because that is completely, those decisions are long gone. They've become you know, overcome by, by events and no longer is somebody sitting there going like, I cannot remember what we thought about two weeks ago, much less six months ago. So this is really keeping the documentation up with the process. And it makes it a lot easier for you to be able to um, to either end a contract, to give the, 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 the software development to another company to come in and, and take over. And what we're really trying to do here as well is reduce the reliance on proprietary um, solutions and to say that only one company can build something and they are the only ones that can then deliver it and, and they kind of own it. We really are believing in, you'll see this in the digital service playbook, but the kind of default to open. We want to we wanna share things. We want to share things among the government. We want to build something that works for the Social Security Administration that might also work for the VA in terms of maybe claims processing. And why shouldn't we spend that same dollar? Um, you know, why do we have to keep spending that dollar and, and repeating the same things where we can really combine that, do one, one process that works for one group and then give that to another one and say, okay, now you start iterating to fit your very specific needs, but we started from the same place. Um, Sorry, I got off on a little tangent there, but basically uh, some of the, the different terminologies between Scrum and XP, you're still getting that whichever way this cycle kind of works. So uh, this, is, this is another view of the Agile software development process and where it intersects with a contract. And up there in the upper uh, right corner, you see that the statement of objectives is actually your product vision. So uh, whatever it is that you're really trying to get in terms of what it is that your scope that you're defining for your contract here. So let's say that you want to build a correspondence system or the library here is that we want you know our, our end users to be able to uh, visit the library and have a complete online experience um, in order to meet all of their needs. And so that's kind of your product vision. You don't have to go much further than that. So that's why we really kind of go back to that statement of objective standpoint versus a performance work statement or even more specifically and restrictive is the statement of work. Um, you really want to hit your high level objectives and then understand what those outcomes are going to look and what is success for those outcomes and then as you define that in your product backlog, which is basically composed of what they call user stories. And even user stories are mini statements of objectives. And it's kind of written in a sense that it's like, I want to check out a book at any time um, online so that I can you know, do my job. 24-7, uh, or I travel overseas, so I have to be able to do that. That's a user story. And so the system then, the, the developers will take that user story and figure out how the system can accomplish that. 
And so this really shows kind of where the, um, the deliverable comes from at the end with your product code. And then once that gets done, it repeats. So the government product owner sets the user story priority, which basically is saying this feature is the most important, we want to get it done now, or maybe it's really, this is an easy feature and we can get some quick wins by getting something out very quickly. And so we want to do that. So it's really based on the mission priority, but within the contract it allows for that complete iteration and having the product owner set the, set the priority. And then as you get enough product code, then you can combine the product code that gets released under each iteration, and eventually you'll have the ability to do a software release. Um, and that's kind of still, we don't necessarily advocate putting um, specific releases within your contract to say, uh, sorry, checking on time. Um, uh, so we, we, we try to stay away from the concept of we're going to build in a very specific release schedule in our contract because what um, you know, we see in terms of Agile is that you can get you know, functional code out and, and have it done under maybe release one um, and then maybe you want to take another couple of uh, times, another couple iterations, build something a little bit bigger, make it a little snazzier and you really do want to do two or three iterations together and then actually do a release. So that's kind of how we build in release management. But it's a joint release planning meeting between you and the contractor, um, the government and the contractor to get that done which is based on the priorities or what can actually be released from the technical standpoint. Um, in, in doing these contracts, some of the things that we're also changing is the way that we look at past performance. Uh, we mentioned the key personnel and the technical solution. Is this you? Okay, so um, past performance is really important to kind of change the way that we say, okay, you must have a government contract and, and show how you've done Agile. Well, there's not really that many out there. So we really want to know that, that these companies that we're hiring to do these processes understand how to implement industry. Agile. We don't want them to come and reinvent the wheel uh, within government. We want them to come and understand already how this actually works. We may still be learning, but that doesn't mean they should still be learning. And there's plenty of companies out there that understand Agile, and there's plenty that don't, and they say they do, and you can't see the evidence of it. So really kind of in your past performance, look for um, things that they've done where they've actually successfully implemented their own, that what they're proposing as their Agile methodology. What were those projects? Were the products, were the end users happy with those products? Um, so it's a little bit more than just saying they had the relevant past performance, but how well did they do and, and how happy is the customer? Because you want to have a good sense of that they actually understand Agile practices. Um, key personnel, um, again, same there. You want them to have a demonstrated experience in Agile and knowing not only the product that you're implementing, but how to do it on the Agile basis. And then the technical solution, they're telling you how they're going to manage, execute, and measure their Agile development needs uh, to meet the end user objectives. Okay. Uh, so just want to pause for a second. Is, is everybody comfortable, have questions, been waiting for the right moment. There we go. Okay. I just had a question about the firm <clears throat> the firm fixed price contracts you mentioned before. And could you give some examples of how um, you know, in some of the previous ones you've done, how they've structured those contracts? Do they set up an IDIQ? Are there BPAs? Because you mentioned these iterations. So I mean how have you seen these structured and what do you think works best? Okay, so uh, the answer is yes. Um, this has been a learning process. I mean, even for Tracy and I, I mean, we've been trying out different methodologies ourselves. Um, IDIQs and BPAs work well. Within IDIQs, you have single award and multiple award, and they can work well depending on how you're using them and what your needs are specifically. Um, I think it's probably a good place to just kind of work through the T&M to the fixed price piece real quickly. Um, so T&M is, is kind of on one end and the fixed price iteration is on the other end in the current sort of concepts of how to do this. And so uh, the T&M methodology, there's nothing wrong with it, um, although there are a lot of um, concern generally with using T&M is considered least preferred methodology. But with regard to its application to agile development, the idea of buying labor hours to, be, to work on agile development products, there is a concept there that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we would generally suggest using that if you have an existing team and you're trying to augment skill sets that you don't have and you want to reach out to T&M skills or labor hour skills that are specific to what your needs are. 
On the complete other end of the scale is the fixed price iteration that we tend to lean towards when uh, your agency is trying to do, implement an agile development program, but you don't have an existing team. And that's not to say you don't have government people that will be um, in that normal product or program management role, but you don't have the actual skills whatsoever to build the products you're trying to build. Um, in that case, the way it's generally structured, uh, again, you have the single award or the multiple award. Uh, let's just talk single for a second. Um, so single award, the way that would be structured, uh, we, we always recommend under FAR Part 39.1, acquisition of IT um, using iterative or, mod I'm sorry, modular contracting, meaning smaller pieces. So we always recommend doing smaller contracting periods of performance. So whether it's a BPA, IDIQ, straight standard C contract we, with, with base and options, we recommend keeping them around six months, but that six month isn't a hard and fast. You gotta really look at your current circumstances and work with your CO to see what's gonna work best. Um, but within that individual period of performance, let's just assume six months, uh, then you have your iterations, and that's what's priced. Um, just for the sake of conversation, again, we'll pick a number and we'll say two weeks, uh, and that's typically what um, the Scrum methodology utilizes. Uh, yeah, that's right, this will tie in perfectly right here. Um, so um, the two week iterations, and that's what's fixed price. So uh, the price for two weeks of performance is, is this, so many weeks of performance make up my period of performance, and that gives my overall price. So, so this slide, which Tracy was correctly pointing me to, is a perfect way to demonstrate that. So this is the IGCE, or the government estimate slide that I had mentioned earlier. Um, so uh, one of the questions we often get is, you know, how do you write a, a government estimate for this? And it ties back to how would you set up the contract. And here's really how you should think about it. So you have your price per iteration. Now the contractor, so, Visualize this, okay, you, on the previous slide, Tracy talked about you had your vision, and you, so you would write a statement of objectives. Bear in mind that statement of objectives goes away at award and is replaced with typically the contractor's performance work statement that may be tweaked a little bit after award through negotiation, but ultimately what they write will be the actual requirements document, and that's saying how they're going to implement that. Sometimes there's an agile development management plan that goes along with that. Um, but they're going to say our Agile process, we are going to use a team of nine people, um, seven of which are core Agile development team, and then there's a half a body. I mean, here you have like two developers, you have a business analyst, a solution architect. This is just a sample. It could be, you could have testers in there. You probably would have to some sort of testing capability in there. Um, in this particular case, the Scrum Master is, is estimated at 45 hours. They could very well be full time, so don't, you know. But anyway, so they would say, this is our team over here. Um, I think that's considered stage left of that slide. <laughs> um, so, um, or no, stage right. So that'd be the blue box over there would be their build, and they'd say, this is our team, and this is the approach they're going to use. So this is why they need so many hours. And so that cost is. $41,500 in this particular case. Okay, so that's one iteration. And then however many iterations make up the period of performance, in this case 26 iterations equals your overall price, I'm pointing to a screen you can't see, uh, is 1.79 million, right? So now when you go back to the IDIQ or the BPA, that price per iteration goes into the contract. So it's contractually binding. And this is really key to the whole thing. When we say you don't have to manage the functional requirements anymore, because that price per iteration has a capacity, okay? Um, meaning they believe they can solve so many user stories in that given period, okay? Their velocity is the measurement of that, but that is what that price was based off of. So whether your user story is to put a man on the moon or get a man into a cockpit of a spaceship, okay, they can only do so much of that effort in two weeks. And so they decompose it down into the amount of story points. So getting someone to the moon might be a billion story points, and they can do 10 in two weeks. So of that getting that man to the moon, of the must-haves of getting somebody to the moon, what is the first priority? Well, it's really important that we build the seat, because if they're not sitting, they're just not going to be willing to, astronauts won't sign up, they really like to sit. So, um, I don't know if that's true, but anyway, they would decompose that and that's the piece they would function on or, or focus on. Let's say the functional requirements change and they don't really need to get to the moon anymore, they just need to get into orbit. Well, that's okay because everything you built up to that point is still getting an astronaut into a spaceship, onto the platform, off of Earth, okay? And if we're no longer trying to get to the moon because we don't have enough time or money to get to the moon, we're still getting into outer space. 
and the fixed price you paid every two weeks stays the same. You write that into the contract. If you have an IDIQ or a BPA situation, you would order more iterations. Um, so under the, under the standard C contract, you would probably have a base period, which would have X number of iterations, and each option period would be pre-specified. That I used to use, I've actually fallen out of favor myself with that because the IDIQ and BPA gives you a lot more flexibility to say in my next period of performance, I only want to buy 10. I only need 10 iterations. Price stays the same, but the overall price for that order goes down because I don't need all of that. That was a mouthful. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that? <laughs> or? Okay. Um, I think with the, the IGC side here too is that you can also see that um, let's say that you have a budget amount that you want to spend or that you have the availability to spend, you can also back into that number to see how much capacity you have based on the team size as well. So if you have $2 million and you know that each iteration is you know $41,000, you can figure out how many iterations you're going to get and by virtue of that, how much capacity you're actually going to be able to do. So you know how many user stories you're going to have and therefore you can plan out based on what you want done in the next year, the next six months, how much of the system or how much of the features do you want to actually start releasing? And then that's the priority, again, the must have, the should have, the, the, the nice to haves. Uh, was there another, I thought I had seen it, yep, okay. Do you have any recommendations on how to, of a way to have a better integration with our ATO or authority to op operate process? That is a very expensive process. At what point do you think uh, uh, we have a better co cost control in the area if we do adopt agile methodology. Um, so, in my in my agency when we did this, one of the the key things that we did as part of the agency adopting agile is that we brought everybody to the table, legal, um, security, everybody, uh, records management, um, 508 compliance. We brought everybody up to the front of the of the room basically and said, let's have a conversation about what you need to be in the process in order for you to accept it when it comes out of the process. So you try to bake in the requirements for the security requirements. Maybe it's a checklist that everything has to meet this or the the you know the 508 compliance is pretty available and out there you have to have 508 compliance so you bake it into the process and that everything that gets designed and developed is according to that already agreed upon process so then at the end of when you're getting ready to release something that ATO should really just kind of say did you meet all the check marks did we check this and and also having security and having those people involved in your user acceptance testing as well on the iterative basis. I think that is one of the key things that is going to um, you know, slow down your agile process is that you can have a, a great uh, company come in, but then when the government gets in its own way with the delays that it creates because of, well, everything we, we do is gonna have a security process of review of three months that's not going to really fly anymore. So if we're bringing Agile to agencies, agencies also have to change mindsets and it can't just be, so we're talking about how to physically do the contract for Agile, but everything, you know, we're changing the way that we're looking at how to do procurement piece. I think every different functionality of part of an agency also has to take a look at it and say, what can we do that's different to help support this um, implementation of this. So it really is management culture at the high end and that has to come all the way down through all of the different processes. So if your ATO process doesn't facilitate that, then start raising that up as a roadblock that you can't actually implement an agile process if it's going to take three months every single time you want to release, um, do one little bit of functional code release, that's really going to slow everything up. Yeah, so that, that, that was, I thought, a great answer. <laughs> uh, I was going to chime in, but you said what I was going to say. The, the only thing I would add to that, though, is that you know, that is like the best case scenario, but it's not always reality. So what will usually happen is parts of agencies' cultures can change and other parts will remain stagnant for some time. And you don't want to not... You don't want Agile to not be successful because of other parts not adapting to it. And so some things you can do to help with that, a lot of agencies, uh, they, they have contracts, uh, usually FTE set up contracts to support the security and ATO offices. Um, they might be open to the idea of an office that was attempting to do a project providing funding for specific support to sell, um, to support their process. So because the, the ATO office already has an established process and if you're not part of that configuration board or uh, configuration management structure, then you're just kind of an, an anomaly that they'll get to when they get to. But if your agency has a structure where they'll allow you to invest in additional resources 
specifically to support these kind of activities, that can go a long way. So that's a potential solu solution. So, yep, good. Um, we have about two minutes. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so um, we'll, we'll move a little bit quicker through the slides, but still, if there's questions, I would rather talk about what you need than what we were going to say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you. Do you have samples, RFPs, awarded contracts, whatever you might, you know, a library of something that can be reviewed, looked it is, at? Cause this it is, is a all slim and growing... Um, uh, <laughs> It, it, we, we are kind of uh, creating these as we go along, but yes, we do have some examples, and um, we will, uh, I think we can provide it as part of the um, samples as part of the information that goes along with the video, so as a result of this, if you check back on, we can, we can give some of those samples there, and also we're um, using, trying to facilitate the use of Acquisition Gateway uh, at GSA as well to create a TechFAR hub. It's not up there yet, but eventually we are going to have that, and that is going to be a repository for all of these things, as well as user stories, uh, best, best, you know, lessons learned, and uh, a way for us to, in the government, to have this, and so it's definitely on our roadmap to get done. We just haven't been able to iterate towards it yet. So um, <laughs> we, we are, yeah, we're, we're drinking our own champagne in, in the uh, head, headquarters here. So, yep. Okay. So, uh, okay. so uh, this, yep. Okay. How accepting or resistive has industry been to using firm fixed price contracts on these types? Yeah, it's been a mixed bag. I mean, just like agencies have been receptive and not receptive um, at first glance. Um, I find, and this isn't a dig at any particular part of industry, I find smaller um, businesses to actually be more open to the idea, mostly because they don't have long established structures that they have to um, modify to accommodate a different contracting approach. Um, but the thing is, it's really the same thing we have to do in agencies that we have to do with industry, which is hold industry sessions and explain to them exactly what we're talking about here. So a lot of times the, the gut response from industry is, is, oh my goodness, you want me to sign up to a fixed price, but you're not going to tell me what I have to do? Like, I can't possibly do that. There's just too much risk. And that's why lar when, I, when I say I'm not digging at any part, but larger parts of industry that are used to dealing with the government that have been burnt potentially in fixed price in the past tend to be a little bit more standoffish at first, although I still get plenty of competition. Um, you got to understand that the same, so again, part of our Part 39 acquisition of IT talks about uh, responsible risk taking, but that's not just responsible risk taking for the government, it's responsible risk taking for, for industry too. So it's actually a lot of risk for industry to sign up for a fixed price on a large acquisition where we think we know everything we want um, and then change our mind. Because even though we're going to pay them for it, it's still a lot of work and rework and it doesn't look that great and it can get ugly. Um, here what we're saying is we're not asking you three months in advance to tell us exactly how you're going to do something. We're asking you to tell us what it costs for your process. And you should be able to define that pretty clearly, especially if we're using commercial services. And then at the start of each of those iterations, we'll sit down with you and we'll plan what we're going to do with that iteration and when we're going to be done with that iteration, what it's going to look like. And there's going to be sessions potentially every day, but at least several times during that iteration to make sure we were clear at the onset meaning both parties, clear what we wanted, clear what we were going to get, and that it's still reasonable. So halfway through, if the government and, um, and contractor agree that you know, what we thought was 10 story points is really putting somebody on the moon, then they can readjust that together. And it's a much more collaborative environment. And, and after we have those conversations with industry, they tend to understand, OK, so what I'm on the hook for is to deliver my process and give you something that works. OK, I can agree to that. And I've also had the experience where the, there's the, um, no, you can't do this. The FAR doesn't allow this. This isn't possible. We're not going to do this. And quick, quite quickly turned around and said, well, it actually does, and here's how. And, and so it had been former, you know, former contracting officers working in industry also having the same kind of concept. So there is a little pushback, but there's also um, acceptance. And, and the same people, the same companies that were saying uh, originally, no, we can't do this. This isn't possible, have now come to me and said, we love this. This is wonderful. This gives us so much flexibility and, and the ability to actually get, you know, work done for you and uh, minimizing their risk. So there is still um, negotiation tactics that you should 
should be taking. And we're actually trying to, uh, you know, work out how to better negotiate these kinds of contracts because of the fact that, um, you know, we, it's it's still new and it's still uh, we're still doing some use cases and, and figuring this out and learning on our own. But we really want to get good at negotiating these as well as we do some of the other types of contracts we have. So. All right, so this slide right here is really just a summary of things we've said several times, so I'm not going to take the time here to go through them again. Uh, the definition of done we were just sort of talking about, this is, is, is key to that, what is that fixed price? And that's really saying it's going to, um, something that you can often have the offerers bid back as, their, as part of their proposal is what do they describe as a definition of done? And something Tracy and I often go back and forth on when we're just talking about this in our free time because that's what we do. Um, is, you know, we're geeks, how, we know. <laughs> you know, how do you compare <laughs> apples to apples? And, and, you know, it's, it's not a matter of comparing apples to apples anymore. It's determining is an apple better than an orange. So let them tell you what they're going to deliver, what it's going to cost and what it's going to look like. And then you decide, you, the government decide, is that going to best meet your needs? And part of that is that definition of done. Um, and so we kind of mentioned there's also new types of metrics that you're building in as well. And we definitely um, advocate that you let them propose the metrics um, based on their solutions. So this is, they're coming to you with their concept for what they're going to have for their Agile. But um, some of the things we're looking at, new terminology here as well, which is burn rate. Um, so that's the trend of the remaining effort. How much is left versus how much was planned. Um, time to market and delivered functionality. What did we think we were going to do and how fast did we get that there? Um, and that's kind of go goes along with velocity and throughput. How much and how fast? Um, if any of you guys are interested, tomorrow at, at 1.30, I'm giving myself a plug. Um, I'm doing a, a case study for whitehouse.gov, which is the first Agile acquisition I did. So it's actually going to talk through the story of how we started and, and where we are now. And I'll show some real live numbers about um, what the actual metrics look like. We used Kanban, which was a cycle. So we really track velocity. How fast were we able to do things three years ago versus how we are doing them today? Um, and so post-production and bug defects and bug rates. This is as important as velocity and, thro and throughput. So this is not the bugs that come up during testing. This is, it's been released, it's out there, it's working, and now we have a bug. And that bug was as a result of the process that they implemented and something didn't get done correctly. Those need to be reduced as the velocity and throughput increase. But there's a certain amount and, and point at which you can't increase your velocity anymore or you can't make the team go faster without the bug rates going faster because the the faster you push a team um, the the sloppier they're going to get and so therefore your bug rates are going to start increasing so figuring out team optimization is really looking at both your velocity and throughput and your bug rates and so and your defects to say how good is the solution we're getting because it doesn't matter if we got it done fast if it sucks when we put it into production or two year two two months down the line then what good was it you know so we really kind of try try to me measure quality by that uh, and this is just kind of a high level uh, lessons learned that that I've put together and that says that you know agile procurements and agile pu pulling in an agile uh, process usually takes at least three to six months of baselining to get the true working velocity from the team day one everybody's got to figure each other out and so you need to keep making sure that those those uh, metrics are being um, followed and they're progressing but you have to understand that the team is really going to uh, get together and communicate and solve problems and once they do that their velocity and their team working ability is going to increase and so just understanding that day one unless you're already doing you've already had experience with the same company they're probably not going to be able to walk in and just hit you know the perfect measure metrics on day one but this is where, you know, performance-based acquisition and you kind of have those ranges of what is a good metric. You want to follow those. So, um, and then government must have a good understanding. Uh, and government is very much more involved day-to-day -day in the process. So it's important that as a CO, a core, uh, your, your CIO uh, group, your product owner, everybody's involved much more on hand. And the reason is, is because it actually, as you start to fail fast, you can make changes quickly as well from the contract. And you don't want to wait till things get to the end. 
Um, and then as a contracting officer, you should request consideration for missed deliverables. So if at the end of a uh, two week period, you did not get your functional code and it's the same as any firm fixed price of delivering, getting a chair, you didn't get your chair on time. What can I, what am I going to get now for that? Maybe it's more user stories. Maybe it's additional bodies to help you get that back on track, but this is a, a good way to keep these things in check. This slide is actually from um, version one. It's the eighth annual state of agile survey. So it's a, uh, it's, it's marketed out there, but this is the lessons learned from industry. So they have as much uh, adoption problems and as we have, except they've done them back in 2000, started forward. We're just a, a little bit behind the curve on that one. So of, a, of adopting agile, but their biggest ones are having the correct executive sponsorship, having training programs and workshops. So highly recommend anybody that's adopting Agile is, is training, 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 get everybody on, on the team done, um, and implementing of a common tool or having a coach. So, um, and then kind of talking about final training, this is something that we're doing at the U.S. Digital Service. We've released this challenge. It's on challenges.gov right now. It actually closes, the submission period closes on the 23rd. And what we're doing is we're trying to figure out a way to train uh, contracting officers for digital services. And that's not only Agile, but it's also how do you buy the, uh, the, the technologies? How do you buy cloud? How do you do DevOps and design? And really getting contracting officers trained up in this. So this program that's out there, this challenge is to get companies and um, you know individuals here. You're you're eligible to enter in on and put a, a technical concept paper together if you want on how would it be best to train contracting officers in the world of digital service. And then eventually, what this will do is it'll have a training and development program which will um, allow for contracting specialists and contracting officers to have that digital service training and be able to work as part of a digital service team or on digital service contracts. And uh, we want it to get implemented by FAI, DAU, any of the training organizations out there. So uh, we're, we're out of time, but thank you very much. And we'll be available afterwards if you guys have any questions. So thank you.